Hello and welcome to episode 8 of the Aquarius Podcast. I'm your host, Randy Reed. For this pre-interview section of the show, I want to give you all an exciting update to my fish room. First, the breeding for Karma Tank is getting an upgrade from a 10-gallon to a 20-gallon long. As the Red Delta Guppy Colony is really starting to ramp up, I know the extra room the 20-gallon long affords them will go a long way to promote healthier spawns and higher survival rates for the fry. Not to mention giving my guppy grass more room to expand as it has almost taken over the whole tank. I really need to get in there and trim it back a bit. Lastly, and much to my wife's chagrin, I built a new two-level tank rack for a 40-gallon breeder on top and a 20-gallon long on bottom. My glass box armada is growing. I have no idea what I'm going to put in those two new tanks, but with the upcoming Greater Seattle Aquarium Society auction almost upon us on Saturday, April 21st, and a hint hint, If you live anywhere in or near the Pacific Northwest, you want to be there for an awesome auction. So who knows what fish or plants I may be bringing home from the auction. That's enough for this part of the show. On to the interview. Today's date is March 9th, 2018. My guest today is Greg Steves. Greg is a true renaissance man in our hobby. Greg is a cichlid fanatic specializing in African cichlids with a concentrated focus on Lake Victoria haplochromines. Greg is a founding member of the Hill Country Cichlid Club in Texas and also president of the Federation of Texas Aquarium Societies. He coordinates the Lake Victoria Cichlid Program for the CARES Conservation Program. Greg has authored countless articles in various fish publications and co-authored a book titled Cichlids of Africa. He's even hosted his own internet radio show called Let's Talk About Cichlids. And to help funnel all this knowledge around the world, Greg and his wife Leanne run the website africancichlids.net where you can listen to past episodes of his show and order a copy of Cichlids of Africa. So, Greg, welcome to the Aquarius Podcast. Thank you very much, Randy. Wow, what a what an introduction. Yeah, and you know, and you know, to be truthful, um, it actually doesn't stop there. So, I, I pull, you know, to do a little uh, pre-show research, um, I used at least four or five different sources that uh, you know where you're a very speaker or somebody for some reason had a profile on you, um, and things that I actually left out. So, fellow, you're a fellow of the Haplochroma Society, which is based in France. You've, you've actually mm-hmm. authored at least three books. You contribute to the Cichlid Companion. Sp- you speak internationally about cichlids. And you present on the native fish of the Texas uh, Guadalupe River system. And then lastly, I'll throw in there, so a previous guest of mine, Lawrence Kent, you also serve as a um, as kind of a... Um, a resource for Lawrence as he's out on his fish collecting adventures to help him identify different species. So um, I actually kind of cut that intro a little bit short, but, you know, I felt like I needed to throw that out there that you are truly a renaissance man in the hobby. Yes, Randy, you're quite correct. I'm a really big deal. (laughs) (laughs) Not really, not so much, but thank you very much. Uh, It's a pleasure to be here, and uh, I hope we can talk about one of my favorite subjects in the world maybe we get time for uh, a little cares talk tonight yeah absolutely i definitely want to have you talk about the, the cares conservation program um one i'm highly interested in um in the cares program and knowing how uh, maybe not now or maybe now but sometime in the future you know that's definitely something that i want to participate in and i would highly encourage my guests or my guests i'm sorry the audience after they listen to this interview um to check out cares as well but let's start so you know i i read that laundry list of things where you have so many accomplishments, so many things that you've done in the hobby. Um, how did it all start for you? Take us back in the time machine. The, the way back machine? The way back machine. <laughs> I, I can't specifically pinpoint a time or an event that uh, kind of set me off on the, the uh, aquatic hobby. I, I've always had a, an aquarium or a jar with tadpoles in it or something since I can remember. Uh, I remember being in elementary school and walking uh, walking home and quite regularly there was a, a pond on the way home and when it wasn't winter and it wasn't frozen over, uh, I'd just be captivated and stay there for hours and it was many, many, many days that my mother would come after me and I'd be in trouble for sitting there watching dragonflies or sticklebacks or, or what have you. So I've always been fascinated with it. I think now that I've had a little time to reflect on it now that I'm older, I think what it is is that the medium of the water, it's a whole different world. Do you know what I mean? I I do. It's almost like you're peering into this, you know, it's almost like space. It's kind of this weightless environment 
Um, exactly. it's, you know, it's yeah. almost like gravity, gravity really doesn't have an effect on these, you know, on these creatures. And it's, it, it's amazing to watch. And you're the stranger in it. Uh, I don't know how I can explain, especially when, uh, I got a little older and started doing some diving and things. You're, you're the person that's out of place in this environment. Everything around is, is the norm and you're not. Whereas, you know, terrestrially, we're walking around and uh, th this is what we're used to. So to me, it was just another world, I guess. And that, that's a fascination that's always kept up with me right to the present day. You currently reside in Texas, right? I do. But, uh -huh. you, but you, do not, uh, you do not grow up in Texas, correct? I did not. I grew up on the east coast of Canada. Okay, and, yeah. as, and as far as your experience in the hobby, um, growing up on the east coast of Canada, I mean, how does that kind of compare to being in Texas? Oh, night and day. That is a fantastic question. Um, as I said, I've kept fish all my life, uh, of all that I can remember. And when I was in Canada, uh, although I had multiple aquariums, the selection of fish was very limited. And that I had uh, that I had access to, and I kept a lot of native things. Uh, I, I had mentioned sticklebacks before. I've always been fascinated with sticklebacks, uh, but then I got into the regular gamut of cichlids and tetras and what, whatever I could keep. And mostly through mistakes, I, I guess I became a, a little bit of an accomplished aquarist. And as I got older. I did, I've never lost the interest in aquatics. So I remember I would, uh, I became a member of the American Cichlid Association and uh, several other groups, and I would get their publication. And I remember, you know, thumbing through the pages and seeing these conventions where there were all these people that were just as nutty as I was <laughs> to fish. And I thought, well, oh, that would be fantastic to, uh, you know, to maybe someday get to one of these conventions. And as fate would have it, I met my wife through uh, through Keeping Fish, and I moved to Texas. And when I got here, uh, a whole other world opened up for me. I found some of those people that I had read about and, and seen their pictures in, in various magazines. And the selection of fish was off the charts, and plus my wife, is very knowledgeable much much she was much more knowledgeable about fish in general than i was and uh so i i guess i learned through uh, osmosis from her a lot of things and uh as at what well, like you said when i got to texas um i found a couple people that were that had multiple tank syndrome as well and it wasn't wasn't very long at all before we formed a club the whole country sickly club uh, that was in 2002, and it's still going strong today. So I'm very, very proud of, of uh, helping to form that club and keep it, keeping it going all these years. Well, that's pretty amazing that you were able to find your significant other, your wife, in the hobby um, and have her be as passionate about it um, as you are, and maybe more so to an extent. Um, where I think most of us, you know, it's, it's quite the opposite. Right. And, and I think for me, that would be incredibly dangerous if my wife was as crazy about fish and tanks as I was. Oh my goodness. I would have, <laughs> that, that garage extension would have been built out a long time ago and I already would have had my full fledged fish room by then. So she definitely, uh, she definitely keeps the balance. I would like to say. That's not necessarily a bad thing. Trust me. <laughs> All right. So, um, so you, like I said in the intro, you specialize, um, or at least you're very passionate about the Lake Victoria haplochromines. Um, were you all like, I guess, how did you get to that point where that particular lake, that particular species? So we already kind of know that, you know, you like cichlids, but of course, you know, cichlids are all mm -hmm. over the world. Um, so how did you progress and get to that point where it was Lake Victoria or maybe right off the bat, you were like, I, these are the fish. I don't want to look anywhere else. Well, uh, as I said, I was up in the east coast of Canada. I lived in New Brunswick, and I would routinely, in fact, I was a member of the Tropical Fish Society of Rhode Island, and there for a while, I would drive the 12 hours to uh, Warwick, Rhode Island, and attend meetings or auctions or functions that they had, 
and one of my uh, one of my friends there had gotten some uh, recently gotten some fish handed to him from uh, Dr. Paul Loisel, who had just come back from uh, Lake Kenya Bola in the Yala Swamp region of Kenya, right on the shores of Lake Victoria. And he had a, a number of fish that uh, Dr. Loisel had given to him, and he worked with them and bred them. And so I was fortunate enough to be the recipient of some, some of his fry, and I took them back to Canada and worked with them. And, of course, at that time, there was very little, if anything, written about these fish. So uh, way, way back in those early days of the computer, there used to be this, um, a, a, like a bulletin board or a mailing list called Cichlid L. And there was a gentleman on there named uh, Dr. Les Kaufman. And at that time, he had been trouncing around Lake Victoria, uh, cataloging different fish, and on a whim, I decided that I would email him and see if he could help me uh, with any care tips or, or maybe even identification of the fish I had. So I gave him the background and and I uh, asked a couple questions to him, and, and he was very uh, giving of his of his time for me. I hear I was a novice starting out, and he was one of the I hadn't known that at the time, but he was one of the leading authorities on these fish. And he was very kind to answer all my uh, rudimentary questions that he could. And I I blame both uh, Dr. Kaufman and Dr. Loisel for sparking my interest in Lake Victoria fish. Once I found out that really no one knew a whole lot about these fish at that time, um, that intrigued me, that it didn't deter me in any way. I wanted to learn everything I could about them. And I read every bit of material I could find. I, uh, you know, I tried to seek out any species from that region that I could and, and work with them. And it wasn't long before I was kind of trying to pass information that I had seen uh, or noted in one form or, uh, or the other onto, pe onto other people and plus try to, try to spread some of my fly and my offspring from these fish around so that they wouldn't all be in one place. And, uh, you know, over the course of time, that's, that's just kept the momentum's kept going. And, uh, I'm still every bit as intrigued by Lake Victoria fish now as I was back then. Yeah. So it sounds like from a knowledge perspective, you kind of had this, um, you know, explorers mentality to it where, you know, it's uncharted territories. Um, and you know, you, you were excited about that challenge and, you know, to an extent, I think, you know, I, I like the underdogs. I like the things that, you know, I like popular things, but I also am really intrigued by things that, um, are kind of oddballs and, you know, people really aren't into. So I could definitely see the interest in that where at the time, if not many people were keeping them or not that much information was known about them and your, your curiosity was just sparked and you want to embark on this knowledge adventure. Um, I can definitely, I can definitely appreciate that. Yeah, that's true. And I think a, um, a big motivation factor for me was the first spawn that I had of them. You know, I had these extremely rare fish, and I was actually able to reproduce them, which in my mind meant I was doing something right. Uh, and then the people that I spread the fry to kind of, I guess looking back, kind of looked at me for knowledge and care tips. And even from uh, very humble beginnings, I guess that's how my my Lake Victoria interest to have, have uh, evolved over the years. Yeah, I think once you start getting the breeding, like in you know, for me is what I've shared with the listeners is, um, you know, I've got some. Uh, melatonin melatonia praycox uh, dwarf rainbows that have bred and i've got some 40 odd fry um i've got some pink flamingos or red deltas whatever you call them some some guppies that have also bred um and there's just something about the uh, you know helping not even so much helping the fish but setting up a tank um getting the conditions right and allowing them to thrive and feel comfortable yeah. enough to reproduce now granted the guppies will probably reproduce in any condition uh but nonetheless like it's it's so fulfilling and i think that's something so special about this hobby that you know the ability to create life and i think that just really um jump starts the the interest in it um so yeah i can definitely um agree with you on that one um, so have you actually had a chance to, to visit Lake Victoria and collect fish there? And if you haven't, do you have any plans to? 
I have not I have not made it to Lake Victoria yet. I would love to someday. Um but all is not lost because uh I live vicariously through Lawrence Kent. Um he's uh, he's been a great friend to me and uh I just cherish those three in the morning calls from the shores of Uganda with a new find. <laughs> <laughs> He's a lot of fun, and uh, so, I, like I said, I've been very fortunate that uh, uh, I get a lot of information through Lawrence. And although I have, I, mean, I, I can see myself going at some point in time. But when I was younger, it was a, a huge goal of mine. Now that I'm getting a little older, if I make it there, great. If I don't, it's you know, it's more about the fish for me. Um, yeah, and we're going to get into your work with CARES, but I mean, you know, I, I think the lake appreciates you regardless of if you've actually physically been there or not, just given your extensive work with the fish that come out of Lake Victoria. Um, so you could almost, I would say in spirit, you have actually been to Lake Victoria, that you have done so much uh, for the, the fish in Lake Victoria um, to make sure that, you know, these, these precious species, you know, they're not lost and that uh, they continue to, at least in captivity, continue to exist. Well, I hope in some small way it's a drop in the bucket. But if if there's enough people that are, you know, a drop each, maybe someday the bucket will be full. Yeah, I mean, I just know from talking with uh, Lawrence and, and attending his uh, most recent presentation at uh, the Seattle Aquarium Society, the Greater Seattle Aquarium Society Fish Club, um, he's got me hooked on Haplochromis. The uh, it, I don't think it has a species name, but it's the ruby green. So he showed a picture of that uh, of a couple that he you know was, he found, and I I don't think he brought those particular ones back, uh, but nonetheless, like that really sparked my interest in um, getting some some African cichlids again, and in particular that that species, that ruby green. There was just something about that fish that um, is absolutely beautiful, and um, I, I didn't think I was going to get any cich African cichlids because up here in a you know Western Washington Seattle area, you know cichlids aren't the most especially African cichlids aren't the most popular. Um, but I, I think at some point I'm going to have to dedicate a tank to that particular species. Well, Lawrence is very addicting. His passion for these fish uh, shine through. So he's, he's a great ambassador for haplochromine cichlids for, cert for certain. So now let's talk about um, your work with CARES. And I guess just give me, you know, give us a general overview of, you know, I've never gone to the CARES website. What is it? Okay. Do you, uh, Randy, I'll take you back and, and try to give you an explanation of what CARES is, why it was formed, and maybe that'll give you some insight as to where we're headed now. Is that okay? No, absolutely. Okay. Well, uh, our commander-in-chief, I guess you could say, is a, a wonderful woman named Claudia Dickinson, and she formed, she formed CARES uh, after uh, Dr. Paulo Zelkoc at the Greater City Aquarium uh, Society. And he, uh, uh, Paul was basically, uh, as I understand it, was showing the dire need for the Aquarius to, uh, you know, take an active part in species conservation. Um, and so uh, Claudia decided to take it upon herself, and she that and thought about it and came up with this this CARES concept, whereas most of the uh, conservation work with fish, with fishes, were done through uh, various zoos and aquariums throughout the world, maybe some universities as well. Um, but if you think about it collectively, how many aquarists are there in the world? How, how much equipment do we have? You know, we have... We have uh, so much at our disposal that if we funneled it in the right direction, uh, we could we could do more for species survival and, and conservation when it came to fish than you know than any zoos and aquariums combined could ever do, and that's basically where where we're at. Um, the idea is for uh, an aquarist to dedicate at least one tank to the long-term survival of the species. And what is, uh, what's surprising to many people that are just getting involved in the program is that 
there's a good chance that some of the fish you already keep are CARES fish. We have what's called a priority list, which is probably our our biggest asset, uh, the biggest thing we do collectively. And this priority list is made up of uh, fish species uh, that require attention. They're either in immediate danger or, you know, foreseeable danger or a guarded condition, uh, what have you. And uh, the list is compiled by experts around the world, uh, mostly with firsthand knowledge of the species. Uh, there's a little collaboration with the red list. And uh, so we've compiled this list of aquarium species that need our help. And if we don't actively try to keep these fish and breed them, there's a very good chance that they will not be around uh, for the next generation to enjoy. They're just going to be gone from the wild. So it might not be an ideal situation, but keeping them in captivity will at least keep the species going. And as time has worn on, uh, we've actually been able to reintroduce several species that were in the CARES program that had gone extinct in the wild, yet were still in captivity, and conditions were just right that we actually have introduced uh, several different species. So uh, in a nutshell, the CARES is a, is a way the aquarium hobbyist can take an active role in the survival, the long-term survival of the species. And that's that's not something to be taken lightly. Uh, you know, the, the big mammals, the mountain gorillas and uh, rhinoceros, uh, these, these animals all get the press. Uh, but there's so many fish species in dire need of help, too. I mean, water is a, a huge resource. Without it, we're all gone. And we're just polluting and diverting uh, waterways, polluting. Uh, it's just a horrible situation. And not only are we hurting ourselves, of course, all the aquatic species um, are suffering as well. So we're losing fish at a very rapid rate. And it, even if the CARES program only saves a couple fish, that's more than would have been saved if we hadn't done anything. Do you know what I mean? I, I hope I explained it okay. No, absolutely. I think you did a, a wonderful job of, of um, explaining the CARES program and the, uh, the the early start to it and kind of what the what the mission statement is. Um, and one of my, you know, very first thoughts that came to my mind, you know, in preparation for this conversation about CARES was um, the ability to reintroduce a species back into the wild. Because when I listen to um, various people will talk about fish and, and just, you know, keeping certain species um, that the moment they start becoming tank raised, they start to lose that hardiness. They start to lose that ability to handle uh, fluctuations and seasonal temperature changes and, and all the things that come with having a tank raised fish. Um, now, maybe that's more so an ornamental when we're, you know, breeding in certain traits and, you know, we're, we're sacrificing the um, durability of the fish, if you will, for more finage or colors or whatnot. But it, that's incredibly promising to hear that we're actually able to reintroduce species back into the wild. Um, that, so that's really cool. And it's not just something where, oh, no, that fish, we saved it, but it only exists in the tanks. So it's great to hear that there are some stories of, of reintroduction. There are, and reintroduction isn't even a possibility if the fish doesn't exist. Absolutely. So, uh, it, it, there, there are cases where we have captive populations of a species that are extinct in the wild that can never be returned because the habitat that they're from, the niche habitat that they're from, doesn't exist anymore. You know, there, it's a very localized spot, and once it's gone, it's gone. So those those species are, are doomed to live in captivity, uh, for better or worse, Um but there are there are some species, uh, especially some gudaid species, that if a suitable habitat is found very similar to the one they they once uh, survived in, uh, reintroduction is possible. So, so let's talk about the specific plight of the fish in Lake Victoria. Um, and, and again, I'm going to. Um, you know, kind of regurgitate, if you will, the knowledge that I learned from from Lawrence Kent um, in his talks, 
in you mm -hmm. know in Asia in South America there's a lot of deforestation um, there's a lot of hey we're gonna take this um, kind of canal you know um, stagnanty kind of water where a lot of species are found we're gonna just fill that all in and we're gonna plant palm oil or whatever kind of you know cash or economic crop um, to support the local population and honestly we could probably have a whole conversation about um, you know the economic development for the for the people to better themselves and the impact on the wildlife and I mean that's probably a whole topic Topic in and of, that is a whole topic in and of itself, um, very heated discussion as well, I would imagine. Um, but w what is the specific plight around Lake Tanganyika? Because I, from what I can tell geographically and, you know, the research that I've done, um, it's not deforestation. It's not filling in of land. Um, w what is it with Lake Victoria? Well, with Lake Victoria, um, it started with deforestation. I think that's safe to say. Um, at the, uh, the, the turn of the 19th century, uh, Uganda especially uh, was a British colony, and, uh, you know, they were pushing railroads through and uh, chopping down the lakeside trees. And a lot of the, the hill region around the lake uh, had nothing to hold the soil anymore. So in the rainy season, uh, there was huge silt runoff into the lake, and uh, it actually... Uh, you know, affected the clarity of the lake. So I guess that's where the that's where the problem started. And as time has gone by, uh, Lake Victoria has had to deal with uh, invasive species. Uh, the Nile perch has uh, done some huge damage to the the cichlid flocks in Lake Victoria. Uh, some of the the introduced tilapian species, uh, same thing. Uh, even the even the water hyacinth was into the uh, so you know a central South American plant was introduced into Lake Victoria and did really well there. It took over uh, vast uh, tracts of of uh, lake and uh, made it unnavigationable in some places. Um, of course, this when you have such plant cover like that. You have uh, you don't have the turnover in the water, so you're losing the oxygen content, especially as you get down lower. Uh, so a lot of those fish that lived at the depths uh, weren't doing very well, uh, so they had to change their habitat. And of course, with uh, going uh, getting a little more modern uh, agriculture, uh, a lot of the the lakeside water has been diverted for. Uh, in different crops, and of course, there's fertilizer runoff uh, left pretty much unchecked right into the lake, and uh, the population has grown immensely all around the lake. Uh, the lake is a, a huge, huge body of water, um, but with added population comes unchecked pollution, uh, unfortunately, running directly into the lake. Um, you know, this, the, all, all these things add up to uh, uh, a disastrous. Um, future for Lake Victoria. Uh, it's, what's amazing is that a lot of the fish that we thought were gone forever actually still survive in the lake. Um, and some of the fish are, are, are doing fairly well from all, all accounts. Uh, the problem is all the cichlid species in Lake Victoria uh, we've put on the CARES list, not necessarily because they're endangered in the wild, but their environment is so unstable that uh, one one event could spell disaster for you know uh, several species in, in an area. So it, we're we're very guarded. It's nice to with Lawrence's work, especially we're seeing that a lot of uh, a lot of the fish we thought were gone do. There's still remnant populations of it there, uh, so that's good news. But conditions in the lake have, haven't improved all that much. Um, maybe the Nile perch, as I understand, uh, a huge predator, an introduced uh, predator into the lake, uh, did very well on a diet of hapochroma and cichlids. Uh, but around, around the turn of the, the uh, around the 2000, 2001 in that area, uh, the Nile perch actually ate itself out of house and home and turned on it. You know, there was no easy prey to get anymore. It had eaten everything. 
uh, so it ate some of the native prawn in the in the lake and actually started to cannibalize itself. And uh, so that that's kind of stabilized, I believe, the hapacromine population. But of course, over the over the years, the upsurge of the Nile perch has created you know one of the largest freshwater fisheries in the world, and a lot uh, you know thousands, if not millions, of people. Um, relied on that fishery and now that it's it's just a portion of what it was you know you have a lot of people that are basically you know have lost their livelihood because the the fish the the fish that we want it gone is leaving <laughs> if that makes any sense so you know it's good for the native the native fish population but the people around the lake quite frankly don't care about these little half of chromine cichlids um they would rather have, you know, a, a two or three hundred pound Nile perch. So it, it's a very complex situation, uh, and unfortunately, it, we don't dwell in the socio-economic problems in the area. Uh, we're only concerned about the fish. So uh, we've got to keep tunnel vision in that in that direction, of course. So um, I hope that answered a little bit of your question. No, absolutely. I mean, there was there's so much there to unpack and to um, you know ask you a little bit, uh, uh, well, to to dive a little deeper into. Um, I guess one of the mm-hmm. one of your statements that really piqued my curiosity was the the water hyacinth. So, how did South American mm-hmm. water hyacinth end up in Lake Victoria? It is believed that uh, it was in a Ugandan water garden along the lake, and after a heavy rain, a couple little pieces floated down into the into the main lake and of course water hyacinth can almost double in size uh you know every day or two so it didn't take long to multiply and and uh it just took over much of the lake especially a lot of the bays and inlets Um, so there were there were there were places that the fishermen couldn't even get out into the lake at one point in time because of the water hyacinth hyacinth and, you know, that's a very special plant. Uh, if, uh, Dr. Loisel had told me a, a, quite a funny story about that. They're, they're, you know, we've always been looking for ways to uh, uh, harness the water hyacinth. What better way to find an industry, you know, to eradicate a, a plant than to find an industry or something we can use it for. Uh, so there was a, I, I believe it was a Ugandan company, actually made a press board out of dried water hyacinth, and it was malleable and, uh, you know, uh, very good construction material, and they started, they pressed a bunch of uh, a wood-like substance out of it and built a couple buildings, and everything went fine. It was very strong, and then uh, when it rained, all of the, all of the walls started sprouting, the, the thing about hyacinth, it can take a it can take a, a a battering, but the cell in every plant is capable of becoming a root, a leaf, or a flower, um, depending on what is needed for that plant. So it's a very special plant. Uh, it's, it's just really tough to do anything with it. But, you know, we haven't found a, a good a good use for it yet, I guess. And it still is a problem, but it's not as not as bad as it was. I know there was a, they were experimenting with a weevil or some sort of beetle that was uh, that was meeting with some success in uh, eating the plant. So I, I don't know where that stands lately. This was several years ago, but um, the water hyacinth is still there, and it probably always will be. Wow. To the best of your knowledge now, the press board application, um, when it sprouted, are, so are they still using it? And Because, uh, I mean, I guess I'm getting in my head this, you know, opportunity for this, you know, uh, Hobbit-style house that sprouts and, you know, you've got a beautiful garden just built into the exterior of your wall. I- I'm assuming that's not what it played out, though. Uh, well, to my knowledge, that's what it was. I don't really know a lot about this. This is a secondhand uh a second-hand tale I'm telling you. Um, 
but I guess the moral of the story was, you know, people are industrious and they're trying to come up with a use for it, a, a way to harness it. And uh, but this press board stuff that they were making isn't going to cut it, I don't think. <laughs> yeah, let's uh, let's see if we can get Lawrence to bring us back some from his recent adventure. There you go. <laughs> <laughs> So um, let's say, okay, so I'm somebody that, um, you know, Lake Victoria or, or any of the, the places that um, CARES is, is trying to make an impact on the fish species, um, you know, me personally, I want to do this, um, somebody listening to this show, hopefully it's multiple people that are, that are listening to this podcast right now, um, you wow. know, ha- have plans for, you know what, I was going to do an extra tank, I was going to add, you know, some, some ornamental shrimp, but maybe, maybe we can get some, you know, maybe I can get on this CARES list and, and try to breed one of these, um, you know, at-risk species of fish. So um, what does that process look like? Like, how do, how do, how do you give a stranger like me um, the, the stewardship responsibility of taking one of these fish, and where does it come from? Like, what is that process? Okay, well, the first thing you – there's a couple things you should know. Uh, the CARES program is very user-friendly. So – you pretty much have to uh, uh, take it upon yourself to figure, okay, I'm going to get involved in this. I'm going to dedicate a tank. I'm going to have this tank for years, and I'm going to keep, um, let me see. You said you had a rainbow fish, didn't you, Randy? I do have. My 75-gallon has rainbow fish in it. What what, uh, species? I've got dwarf neons and bosmani. Bosmani. Okay, well, bosmani is endangered. Did you know that? I did not. Yes, it's a it's an endangered species, and it's on the CARES list. So you're already keeping CARES species. So my question to you is, why haven't you registered it yet? <laughs> That's a, that is a good question. So I, I would I would say ignorance. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. I've got a new recruit here. So uh, listen, Randy, what you would do, you would go to the website. This is the first thing where you should start, and the website is caresforfish.org. That cares for fish, all one word, dot org. And we'll make sure that gets in the uh, show notes as oh. well. I'm sorry? We'll make sure that that gets in the show notes as well. All of the uh, the good links um, and information, we'll Beautiful. make sure that's that's available for listeners. Beautiful. That that would be great. Uh, because if you're, if you're just new to the CARES program, you can find everything you need to know there. And if there's something that you you would like to know that you can't find there's a a listing of people that are accessible to answer any questions that you might have um where i would start off is is uh, at the very first page the welcome page and we have uh, uh claudia has written a little introduction that kind of gives us an idea of what cares program is and uh the most recent articles that we have up there uh, and some of the programs we have going. So uh, it's easy to uh, maneuver around here. Uh, they're all drop-down menus. Uh, but like I, like I had told you before, probably our, our hugest asset in CARES and on the website here is the priority list. And this is a list of fish that we deem uh, to be threatened in one way or another. Uh, to one degree or another, and as I said, your your bosomis are bosmanis on there. Uh, I'm just telling you that people that are uh, into the hobby that has two or three species of fish, check that list out. Chances are that at least one of your species is on that, and it'll surprise you. Excuse me. <coughs> oh, pardon me. So, uh, so you already have a care species. So the next thing you do is want to uh, register it. So, uh, excuse me, Andy. No, no worries. <laughs> oh, my goodness. A little dry there. Uh, so what we've tried to do is we've tried to get uh, the the clubs involved in CARES so that they run their own program. When we first started CARES, we tried to format everything uniform for all clubs. And quite frankly, it was a lot of work for us. It was just too much to keep up with. So we had a meeting of the minds not too long ago, just before we released the new website. And uh, 
we came up with this idea of breaking down the CARES program to its uh, basic roots. It's all about saving the fish. How we do that, it, it doesn't really matter. It's the end goal that matters. Um, so we maintain this priority list and try try to run individual CARES programs through, through uh, clubs. Um, I believe the, the Seattle club you're involved in either – had a CARES program or still does have an active CARES program. And I'm sorry that I, I can't think of that right off the bat, Randy, but uh, uh, definitely check with the, your folks there and see if they're still running CARES. Um, so that's what we recommend. People get with a local club and uh, you can register your CARES, on, CARES fish on the website. But even if you're not involved with the club, if you're a, a lone wolf or not near, um, not near a club, you can uh, you, you can register as an individual cares for individuals. Although uh, my my club, the Hill Country Sickly Club, we uh, we have we have no dues, and we take members from all over the uh, all over the country, and this enables them to uh, join the cares program through us. So it's just a, a helpful device uh, to get involved in cares, but. Regardless, anyways, so you've got your fish, and you know what you're going to want to do is register the fish. So what this what this involves is sending a photo, and this is all done online through the website. You you uh, write write your species, your affiliation, a couple of basic questions, and you mail a photograph. It doesn't have to be a professional quality photograph. It can be with a cell phone or anything at all and you uh, send the the, uh, the information online and it honestly Randy it, it takes less than five minutes to fill out uh, everything you need for that species to register it and this goes to our cares team and when they get the uh, when they get the information for you example when you're you're uh, uh, doing your rainbow fish It'll come to the the CARES team, and the CARES team will look at it, and they will send your uh, photo to the. Um, let me see. Uh, give me a second here. I'll bring this up uh, to the care specialist that will uh, give us yes, that is the fish, or it could be the fish, or no, it is not the fish. It's just a check valve to make sure that. Uh, the species you're registering is the actual species. Um, you'd be surprised a lot of people are, are keeping fish that they think is one species and turns out to be another. And it's it's no big deal. I mean, if you were, you know, given this given this fish as a certain species, uh, why should you doubt that that's what it is? But that's where our specialists come in. So we verify that you have the fish that you're submitting. Uh, which is a, a really quick process, usually less than a day or two. And then the uh, information uh, gets sent back to the CARES team, and they send it on to your local club. And the uh, the club has a database. It's a very simple database that we give to every CARES uh, club. And they register. They uh, You'll hear from the CARES team say, welcome to the program. Uh, your registration has been accepted. And once that fish is in the CARES program and you're successfully breeding it, uh, say you give your you give some fry to uh, a, a friend of yours, a, a fellow aquatic uh, aquarium keeper, uh, they can use your uh, information as part of their pedigree for their fish. So they're entering their fish is that much easier because yours is already registered. Does that make any sense? No, absolutely. I mean, you guys have clearly thought this thing through and have, um, and like you have said, have, has made, you have made it very, very user friendly. Um, I think one of the things that I definitely want to point out and highlight to everybody listening to this, and while you know we were talking a good bit about your passion for cichlids and Lake Victoria, um, not every carrotfish is is a cichlid from Lake Victoria. Um, I mean, just real quick, I'm gonna I'm gonna 
fly through this. Um, but mm-hmm. on the on the priority list, you have, and this is just by you know grouping: rice fish, gouramis, killifish, rainbow fish, tetras, cichlids, loaches, uh, minnows and carps, pupfishes, gobies, uh, split fins, armored catfish, rainbow fish, squeakers, tooth carps, live bears, blue eyes, rivulus, valencias, and a couple other ones that I just flew over. Um, so yep. it, it, what I'm getting at is, I mean, if you are a um, loach person, hey, you, there's there's some loaches on this list. Um, and also the tank size. So not everything, you know, you don't need to have a spare 55 or 75 or 125 gallon tank. Um, I, you know, you could, you know, some of these rice, rice fish, some of these uh, tetras and, uh, and live bears, Absolutely. you know, you don't need massive tanks to, to join care. So um, if you have a little bit of spare real estate and, and if you're like me and you struggle with your wife being constantly frustrated that you're trying to get more tanks in, say, look, I'm trying to make a difference, right? And I've wanted, I actually wanted to bring this up. I can't save Siberian tigers. You know, I can't save the white horned rhinoceros. I can't keep one of those in my backyard. I can't breed those guys, but I can breed some rice fish. You know, I can breed, I can, I can take care of some endangered live bears, you know? And I think, uh, and I think if you've ever had a soft spot in your heart for when you see an endangered list or you pull up an animal on Wikipedia, and you see that it's potentially, you know, vulnerable or endangered or threatened, um, and you've wanted to do something. Well, now you actually have an opportunity, and it, it it extends just beyond a donation of money. Like you can actually get some of these species um, and help to raise them. And so, I guess on that note, um, I don't want to say it's shopping, but let's say like legitimately rice fish. Like cool rice fish. Like in this particular one that's vulnerable. Like is is there any way that somebody in the um, in the larger cares network? Like do they typically say okay, here here's a male female. Here's your rice fish. Go pay for shipping, whatever it may be. Um, or does it not quite work that way? No, uh, this has been an offshoot of our original thought process. Uh, which has been a great a great thing for a lot of people. We maintain a master database. Uh, we don't share it because there are some some people that would be bothered by other people wanting a fish they had. Um, I, I won't go into it much, but there's some people that would like to keep their collection, uh, you know, close to the chest. So uh, they don't want. They they want to be involved in the CARES program, but they really don't want to advertise their collection. And uh, there's very good reasons for that. I I, I stand behind that. Uh, that's a, a person's choice. However, Randy, let's say that you have a uh, a fish and you have you had a a male and a female, and they were a high priority CARES list fish, and you lost the female. So you're left with a male. Now, wouldn't you rather find someone else that maybe was in a similar uh, a similar situation as you, maybe had a, a dwindling group that maybe you could give your loan fish to and help them out, or maybe they have extra fish that they could help you out? Well, this has happened a lot, and uh, what we, we facilitate it. Uh, for example, you can ask the CARES team, uh, either through the website or uh, – as, as you get involved, you probably know many of these people and have them on a, a Facebook chat or what have you. Uh, it's just the way the world is. Um, but we have in the past set people up with each other so that they could uh, they could take both of their whatever they had and make a remnant population of them. I've had it happen to myself. I had one particular fish, Pundamilia igneopinus, and... Uh, a very beautiful Lake Victoria fish, and I was left with uh, a couple males and no females. And I was very concerned. It's not a very common fish at all in the hobby. And I was concerned that I was going to end up losing these males. They were just going to grow old. And through the CARES Network, uh, we actually found someone who needed a male, actually had females of that species, and we were able to to hook the groups up and... uh, Luckily, he's done very well with them, and uh, he's uh, well on his way to establishing the fish in the hobby again. So there's a, there's a lot of offshoots that have come from the CARES program that we weren't, we didn't really uh, look to create, but have uh, have have uh, 
formulate it themselves, and it, it's a very good thing. Uh, anytime you can you can keep a species going, uh, all the better. Although um, I must say, Randy, that the one thing I want to stress with the with the CARES program, uh, we have a lot of people that like to get involved in it, uh, but it's kind of a fly by night thing. They get you know after six months or a year, they get kind of bored of the fish. And that's fine. A hobbyist uh, can do that. Uh, it's, they're free to do it. However, the uh, one of the goals of CARES is long-term survival of the fish. So what we really try to stress, it's not like a breeder award program or anything like that, which has its, pay, which has its place in the hobby, of course. Uh, this is really a long-term goal. Uh, we try to let the hobbyists know that we want them to keep a – a colony, a viable colony of the fish that he or she has registered for as long as possible and, uh, you know, have success with them, spread them around uh, to other people. Uh, it's not, it's, I guess what I'm saying, I would rather someone that wasn't willing to put in a long-term commitment maybe passed on the CARES program, if that makes sense. Uh, we're really looking for people that will help the fish long term uh, because that's what it's going to take. And uh, so far, uh, we've been pretty successful with that, and our network uh, uh, extends now. We've uh, got thousands of hobbyists involved in the CARES program, and it's been very rewarding for all involved, and it keeps on growing, and uh, we couldn't be happier with it. Yeah, no, I think those are absolutely valid points that you bring up. The first, the uh, completely on board with you as far as the privacy goes of your members, um, but knowing mm -hmm. that there is still opportunity where, like in your situation, where you know you've got the male, um, or was it the females? Well, one of the the opposite sex dies off, and then you're left with the, only the one gender, um, you know, and it is a care species. The ability for the network to, you know, with behind the scenes coordinators and obviously being very um, um, uh, understanding of people's privacy concerns, still being able to make that connection happen um, so that the species itself is, is, um, is made for the better. Um, and then also, yeah, I mean, f totally fair call out on, you know, not, this is, you know, it, it's, it's like adopting a dog, right? It's, it's like rescuing a dog that you are going to have, you're going to have this animal, you're going to care for this animal for the long haul. Um, this is not, mm -hmm. you know, this isn't the lease on a brand new car that you're just going to turn in in a year or two years and you're going to get the next shiny model. Um, and, and I would say to those people that, you know, myself included, that, that really likes the idea of a breeder award program, um, this, mm -hmm. this is going to give you that, you know, sure, if you breed it, you're going to get obviously in your breeder award program, but this is going to give you a sense of fulfillment that, again, you are helping a species that is potentially at risk in the wild. Um, and that in and of itself should come with an award um, that is far greater than just, you know, a, and it, you know, some extra points in your fish clubs um, breeder award program. Yeah. So, um, yeah. definitely, but I, so I guess to go back and then, and kind of refine and not make it sound like it was a shopping list, but let's say, you know, is it, is it fair to say, Hey, I've got a 10 gallon, I've got a 10 gallon tank. It is mature. It's got plants. Um, it is a, it is a good tank. It's just looking for some inhabitants. Um, and mm -hmm. with like kind of a second caveat of, I like rice fish. And now I've never kept rice fish. I just keep using them because it's literally at the very top of your priority list is rice fish. Sure, sure. Um, so is is that a fair, like, hey, cares, you know, I'm dedicated. I'm in this for the long haul, 10-gallon tank. And I kind of like the idea of getting rice fish. You know, is is there anything in that sense? Or is it, you know, hey, hey, Randy, we're going to get back to you and say, great, you have that 10-gallon. But we've actually got some of these, um, we've actually got some live bears for you. No, it, it, definitely not. It's totally up to the hobbyist. In fact, uh, finding the fish is also up to the hobbyist. Now, uh, we've done a couple things to try to help facilitate that. Um, we've recently uh, created this uh, a publication, a magazine, if you will, called the Cares Exchange. And the whole, the whole idea of that was to provide a... Um, like a trading post, like the old ACA trading post uh, used to be, where people can list fish, the cares fish that they have for sale, uh, which is perfectly fine. The ads are free. Or if you're looking for a fish, you can also place a free ad in it. And uh, it's it's been highly successful in, in finding, uh, you know, putting a hobbyist with the fish they're looking for. 
uh, finding finding where they are and, and letting the, the hobbyists get them. So anyway, it's, it's, uh, we're, we're trying to with a, uh, we're trying to facilitate a way to get some of these fish uh, that you might want. Uh, but in the end, it really comes down to the hobbyist to, to locate the fish and take care of getting it. We're not a, uh, uh, we're not a finder, a finding network. Uh, although the, the people that are involved in CARES, uh, how I, in my experience, are some of the most giving people I've ever met. Uh, not only the, the species coordinators, but the actual members that partake in it. So, uh, it, you know, it's, it's usually fairly easy to get an established fish. Um, oh, and Randy, if I may, when we were talking about the, the breeder award program with some of the clubs, I had just re- recalled there's a couple clubs that have come up with a unique way to formulate the two of them. Uh, they actually will give additional points uh, in your BAP to, to a CARES fish, and there's even some clubs that, in order to encourage the long-term keeping of CARES fish, will take a BAP on that species each year. What a really good idea. So that just, pop- I just yeah, to add yeah, I'm that, all over the place. I'm yeah, sorry. no, no, no. That just popped in my head as well when you had said that you know, kind of pairing the two together. Um, again, kind of emphasizing that longevity of um, you know awarding somebody for um, you know keeping it uh, keeping it on the long term. No, again, not that we yeah. should need <laughs> not that we should need that extra incentive, uh, but it's you know it's, that's nice that it's there. Well, you know, people that are uh, people that are in clubs. Uh, are there for a reason. They they enjoy keeping fish, but they also love the company of other people that have similar interests as them. And a breeder award program is very popular in a lot of clubs. And uh, we you know we should try to facilitate everything we can to keep uh, keep interest in aquatics of all kinds. And I I might say as well that uh, you know you can get into species survival you don't need the cares program uh we're there if you want to join us uh, but you can use our priority list and see what species need help uh you know it's all about the fish it really is uh it's about saving the fish if you want to work with the fish and don't want to get involved in cares hey that's totally up to you we're still going to do everything we can to uh help anyone out you know do you know what i mean i mean the priority list is there um we're going to keep it updated uh try to try to give you the most updated information on all these species that need our help and we you know we would hope that you would join the cares program but if you would rather uh you know just keep fish on your own hey so be it that's that's great you know if you're keeping if you're keeping an endangered species for years and years that's the end the end result is the same as the cares program so we're all for it no and i think that definitely speaks to your passion for the uh for this and and claudia for starting the the cares program um it's all about the fish you know it's not about you know hey we cares has x many members and and you know this and that statistic um you know the just just that statement right there that you made shows um, just how important the fish are to you guys in conserving um, and keeping these species around and hopefully, you know, being able to, to reintroduce even more species back into the wild. Yeah, that would be a wonderful uh, long-term goal for sure. And as I said before, if the, if, the, if the fish doesn't exist, it can't be introduced. So, you're, you know, if you argue about whether the fish has anatomically changed uh, being kept in captivity for so long, it's really a moot point if it doesn't exist. So that's where CARES comes in. Keep, keep, we keep them in captivity, and you know, a worst case scenario, it'll be a captive bred fish forever. Um, you know, best case scenario, maybe someday conditions will change and, and we'll be able to reintroduce it. Um, Randy, I've, I've mentioned Claudia, of course, um, a wonderful, wonderful lady, but I would, uh, I would not feel good if I didn't mention two other people who have been instrumental in the CARES program since its inception. Uh, if you don't mind, I'd like to give a, a big thank you and shout out to uh, Leslie Dick, uh, who does the, the CARES for individuals, among many other things, and uh, Klaus Steinhaus, who uh, 
uh, it coordinates with with the clubs and just chips in wherever wherever is needed. Those two people are are wonderful, and CARES would not be what it is today without either of them. Yeah, no, absolutely fantastic. That's um, you know anybody that that you feel the need to uh, to give them a shout out on this show, the free mic for you. Well, thank you. I you know we'd be here uh, we'd be here for a while because it's not a it's been a big effort, a, a large effort with many people. And uh, hopefully if you'll visit uh, caresforfish.org, um, you'll be able to see all the people involved in CARES and the, the coordinators and uh, all listed uh, along with a small little bio. And they're all, uh, all great people and have helped the program become what it is today. Yeah, so I can tell you uh, definitely after uh, you know we get done with this phone call, the, the, my first step is going to be to register my Bozmani Rainbow um, and you know join the CARES organization in that sense. Um, and then as I plan to you know grow out my uh, my fish room, now that I have a greater understanding of you know the priority list um, and you know the the onus is really on me. Um, to you know, to identify and to locate these species, um, but you know, to plan on having at least one tank dedicated to a care species, um, and do do my honest best to try to find something that um, you know isn't readily available um, in a fish store. If it costs me a little bit more to get from a from somebody on Aquabid or a private collector, so be it. Um, but you know, to me, I mean, that you know, personally, it just it it would mean that much to me to be able to have. Um, something that is on the priority list, something that, you know, is not readily available, um, at, you know, and hopefully hopefully be able to breed that and share that with people in my community and, and share that with other people as well. Oh, that, that would be fantastic. And another, uh, another convert. Um, <laughs> I'm proud of this one. Hey, no, yeah, I've got, I've got a soft spot, so no, uh, no, no worries there, Greg. So I just want to say, Greg, thank you so much for uh, taking time out of your out of your day um, to talk with me about your background, about your love of uh, Lake Victoria cichlids, kind of the plight that Lake Victoria um, is suffering right now, um, or the the history behind that, I should say, and then also really just taking taking some time to lay out what the CARES program is, um, CARESforfish.org. Again, we're going to have that link in the show notes, um, and I would really thank highly you. encourage everybody. You know, it's awesome to have really cool shrimp. Neocaridina, Caridina, all these beautiful patterns and, you know, all these awesome guppies that we're importing. But, you know, if you've got the real estate for a tank um, and, you know, and you can find one of these fish that's on the CARES priority list, I mean, you know, do yourself uh, do yourself the favor and just, you know, get that feel good, um, you know, the feel good karma of having a CARES fish and also know that it's going to be for the long haul. Breed it and try to share it with as many people as you can. I couldn't have said it better. Thank you so much, Greg. <laughs> Greg, you have a, a wonderful evening. I thank you so much, and uh, hopefully I can have you on the show again here in the future. Anytime at all. Thank you very, very much. Have a great night. You too. There you have it, everyone. You have an excellent opportunity to help a vulnerable, threatened, or extinct in the wild species of fish. Please go to the CARES website and register your fish if you are already keeping a CARES species. And if not, Put in some work at the keyboard to find one that you can keep for the long term. Like I said to Greg, we can't keep endangered elephants, tigers, or rhinos in our backyard, but we can all dedicate a 10, 20, or 40 gallon tank to a few fish in need of our help. Thank you all for listening. Please like, subscribe, and share this podcast with your fish nerd friends. I truly appreciate it. And now the sign off. Get involved in your local fish club, help grow this wonderful hobby, and have fun with other fish nerds.